Hey, everybody, this is Charles Dobbins, the founder of the Multifamily Investing Academy and the creator of the Multifamily OS system. Welcome back to this week's podcast. This one is one I have been waiting to do for so long. I'm so excited to have, and I, I, I lovingly refer to you, Richard, as Professor Rothstein. So I'm going to give you the honorary designation. My, my brother would, would, uh, would approve, uh, my professor brother would approve, but uh, I have Richard Rothstein and his lovely daughter Leah back on, and and Leah was on my Monday Night Live call with all my clients. We had a fantastic conversation. People talked about it for for, for weeks afterwards. It was so great. Richard Rothstein has written. Oh no, I'm on the virtual. Oh no, it won't be seen. How do we see this? Oh, I'll, oh no. Oh, you know what? It's all the colors. I'm so. Oh, that's so bad. Hold on. I'm going to fix that right now because that's not right. Um, I'm going to fix my background because I want to show the book. Um, and I'm going to go to none. Okay, good. So I am back. All right, now you get to see them. And here's the book, The Color of Law. This book, you have to have it. It is a fantastic read. It changed the way I think about our world and especially housing in it. And it was all because of this gentleman right here, Richard Rothstein. And he is on my show today because he and his daughter, and, and then let me just say, so Leah was on my, my Monday Night Live call and uh, she got to meet a lot of my clients and we talked about things from the book. And it was a fantastic conversation to hear Leah go back and forth with my students. It was so much fun to, to see the barb. Um, thank you so much, Leah, for, for doing that. That was a lot of fun. Um, they're back here today because the two of them have written a book, the follow-up book to The Color of Law. It's called Just Action, How to Challenge Segregation and Acted Under the Color of Law. And it essentially is a blueprint for things that we can do in our communities to help solve this problem of what's called de jure segregation or uh you know how our government has has created this this racial divide in housing so richard how have you been Hi, thanks yeah you look good you look good i mean you look it was like a, two years ago leah that your dad and i spoke he hasn't he hasn't aged a bit my father would say that yeah i know i've always looked this old that's what <laughs> He, he would say, but um, okay. So how has it been first off working with your daughter? And then, uh, you know, when did you know that this book needed to be written? Well, the previous book, the one you showed, um, the color of law demonstrated uh, how segregation was residential segregation was created in every metropolitan area by racially explicit government policy at the federal state and local levels yeah uh, it was a history book uh and it, as as with you it really changed the way people thought about segregation previously they thought it was something called de facto segregation something that just happened by accident uh what the color of law demonstrated was that de facto segregation is a myth uh, it was created by fairly explicit and locally and state explicit racial policies that was so powerful that they still determine the segregated and unequal uh, residential landscape of today. Well, it was a history book. Uh, it told how it happened. I uh, spent a lot of time going around the country talking about it. And everywhere I went, people said to me, well, what do we do about it now? OK, we understand it was unconstitutionally created. What do we do about it? And uh, my response was, uh, that there's no consensus, no, no consensus nationally for federal policy to fix this, but there's lots that can be done in a local level, at a local level, to, uh, for local citizens, residents, to join together to make real advances in redressing the effects of this segregation. And uh, I kept on answering it in this way, and I began to realize that I needed to write a new book about the kinds of things that people could do in their own communities to redress segregation. But I also knew uh, that uh, I needed a collaborator because my uh, I'm a historian, uh, not really, I'm a journalist, but you know, a historian mostly. I don't didn't know uh, that much about 
local housing policy. I learned a lot, but I needed a collaborator. And uh, I recruited my daughter, who knows a lot about housing. She's a, she is an affordable housing consultant and uh, has worked in this field and field of public policy for, for many years to collaborate with me. And we wrote a book, since you're showing books, uh, called Just Action, uh, that uh, 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 how to challenge segregation enacted under the color of law. And it goes into uh, policy after policy, program after program, that are local, but each of them having a small impact. But in some, they could make a big dent in the ra racial inequality we have in this country today. So Leah and I worked together. It was a wonderful experience uh, for me, and uh, I think for her as well. Um, and now I can retire. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's not going to happen. So Leah, uh, how many interviews did it take to get the job? And was, was it a nationwide search uh, <laughs> before he tracked you down? So uh, that's great. Listen, just kind of give everybody a, a, a history lesson. And this is, I, I pretty much got this from your book. I mean, we started to see the, the changes during Reconstruction. Then in 1917, you had that that uh, Buchanan v. Worley Supreme Court decision, and that kind of really gave you the vision of what happens at the local level. And then you started to see it happen, uh, you know, I'm jumping forward, like with the FHA and the VA, 1934-ish, 1935. Uh, but then, Richard, the world was supposed to get fixed in 1973, I think it was, with the uh, with the Fair Housing Act. And, you know, you're saying it, it hasn't been fixed yet. Well, yes. Yeah, so let me just, uh, I'll answer your question. I want to turn it over to Leah to, to tell you how we can fix it, um, or at least take significant steps to fix it. We don't like to overpromise. The Fair Housing Act was in 1968, by the way, uh, not 1973. Um but, what happened in 73? I thought there was something in 73. But lots of things uh, in 73. Yeah. <laughs> Leah, Leah was born or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite, but almost. <laughs> um, the most powerful policy that the federal government followed to ensure segregation was a policy of the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration to move the entire white working and middle-class population into single family homes in all white suburbs from which African-Americans were excluded. And as we demonstrate in this new book, those suburbs at the time were uh, affordable to African-Americans as well as to whites. They were inexpensive homes, all the suburbs. The example uh, I used in the first book in The Color of Law was Levittown. Homes there sold for you know $8,000 at the time, uh, about $100,000 in today's money. And the same thing was true in communities all over the country. Well, those, uh, and this was racially explicit policy on the part of the federal government. Uh, they had, the Federal Housing Administration had a manual that uh, offered bank guarantees to build these developments, these suburban developments, provided the developers like Levitt uh, uh, promised never to sell a home to an African-American. And this was written out in the federal uh, policy manual that was issued to appraisers all over the country, whose job it was to recommend uh, developers for federal bank guarantees. Well, today, those homes no longer sell for $100,000. They sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, in some places, a million dollars or more. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 said, in effect, uh, OK, African-Americans, you're now free to move into places like Levittown. But they're unaffordable now. Yeah, uh, working class families who don't have the uh, down payments that they would have got, that whites got from the appreciation and the value of their homes that they inherited from their parents and grandparents. So we need many more aggressive policies and simply saying no more discrimination that the Fair Housing Act promised, even though the Fair Housing Act itself has not been well enforced. But we need much more aggressive and racially explicit policies. And that's why uh, I wrote with Leah, this new book, <laughs> just, uh, you know, uh, I'll tell you one, you, you told me that story about Levittown opened my eyes. And especially that I was in my studio at the time, which I had inherited from my father, uh, on a VA loan 
And there I am thinking to myself that this issue is a generational one because here I am benefiting from the, my father's VA loan that he got back from the Korean War. And he could have been fighting right alongside some African-American who had a kid or a grandchild who lacks the, the amount of equity that I now have because he wasn't allowed to buy in the same neighborhoods. I, my dad was able to buy it. And that just made me think, wow, this is unbelievable. This is not just, oh, that a slight to that soldier back in Korea. This is a slight to every generation further in his family. Well, that's correct. And, and that's why I say that the Fair Housing Act itself is not an adequate <clears throat> remedy for this. Uh, these were unconstitutional policies that the federal government followed. State and local governments followed unconstitutional policies as well to reinforce this federal policy. And as Americans, we have an obligation, if we take our citizenship responsibility seriously, to redress these constitutional violations. And uh, as I say, that's what Leah and I wrote about in this uh, new book called Just Action. All right, Leah, let's uh, let's educate your father about Section 8, okay? Because that, that was one of the more, more colorful discussions that we had on the call. And, and uh, you know, the first time I talked to your dad, I thought I was really the smart guy. I say, but, Richard, uh, Section 8 is really actually a very good program. It, it is, you know, colorblind, blah, blah. And your, your dad put me in my place very, very quickly and made me think about just how bad Section 8 is as a, as a housing policy. Now, does the book, Just Action, does it have any remedies for Section 8 policy around, you know, at different offices? Yeah, we talk about Section 8 at great detail, and I'll just give some background. So Section 8, you know, for those who don't know, is a rental subsidy program, the largest rental subsidy that the federal government provides to 2 million low-income households. It has a promise to be a, a great program <clears throat> because folks can use the subsidy, their voucher, to rent anywhere on the private market. So the idea, the intention, the promise is that it gives lower-income tenants the opportunity to move out of high poverty neighborhoods because their voucher can be used anywhere. But there's all of these aspects of the program that make that almost impossible for most voucher holders. Only 5% of Section 8 voucher holders live in what are called high opportunity neighborhoods. So neighborhoods with good quality schools, access to open space, transportation, jobs, so only 5% of Section 8 voucher holders are sort of living up to the potential of the program. And there's a lot of reasons that that is and a lot of ways to address it that all can be done on the local level. So one is discrimination. On the federal level, it's legal to discriminate against tenants who have Section 8 uh, to help pay their rent. So federally, it's allowed. But a lot of states and about 100 localities around the country have what are called source of income discrimination laws. And that means that it is no longer legal in those localities to discriminate against a tenant because they use Section 8 to help pay their rent. So in places that don't have one of those laws, a local group could help get one passed. In places that do have one of those laws, it needs the, you know, that needs monitoring and enforcement to make sure that um, Section 8 tenants aren't still being discriminated against, you know, being turned away from a unit just because they have Section 8 even though they could afford the unit using their voucher. So that's one issue. The other is the amount of the voucher itself. <clears throat> Federally, it's set to be, so the maximum amount that a voucher will help pay for the rent is set, it's capped at 40% of the median rent of an entire metropolitan area. So you take the full span, the lowest to the highest rent of a huge metropolitan area, Take the immediate, you know, the middle rent of all of those, 10% below that is the maximum rent that a voucher holder can pay. So by definition, over half of the rents in this metropolitan area are out of the reach right. of voucher holders. Right. And that's why they can't afford to move out of high poverty areas often. Now there's a fix to that too. Um, there's uh, now 180 housing authorities in 24 metropolitan areas are required to use a different maximum voucher uh, formula, which is set on smaller areas. So in higher cost parts of the metropolitan area, a voucher is worth more. 
than in lower cost areas, which makes sense, right? It's more tailored to the actual location within a metropolitan area rather than based on the median of the whole area. And that allows voucher holders to move more easily to higher cost areas because their voucher will pay more in those areas. So in these 24 metropolitan areas, the housing authorities are required to use this, this payment standard, but in any other area, a housing authority can voluntarily adopt to do that, um, opt to do that. So a local group could work with their local housing authority to get them to adopt these um, smaller area, they're called small area fair market rent standards. Um, they can adopt it metropolitan area wide, or they can just decide in higher cost areas of their jurisdiction, their voucher will be worth more. And that that really goes a long way to help voucher holders move out of high poverty areas and have more mobility options. So those are a couple examples of um, locally controlled issues with the voucher program that really would make it live up to its potential more. Okay, so just so everybody understands, from a uh, you know boots on the ground perspective here, as owner operators, if many of my listeners are, um, you know the fact is that we try to get Section Eight. We're giving they're given a max. That's the most Section Eight will pay in that area. That's just the way we talk in our in our lingo, mm -hmm. and that in and of itself allows the federal government. And you know, down to the the uh, the local level, but it allows them to put the Af African American, the lower lower income people in a particular area of town. They are stuck there. That's where they're going to live. That's where their kids are going to be sent to schools. And be, you think that well, we're helping them out with their housing, yeah, but we're not desegregating we're we are truly segregating by the that section eight policy and and your dad mentioned the first um last time we spoke you know just like you said give higher amounts for the vouchers and you'll ab you're able to move that kid out of a bad school into a better area that he never would have access to but for having a higher voucher so you mentioned about 180 uh, offices in you know, 24 areas. Where are, are these? Are these areas um, kind of in one location? Where can I find these areas? How can we find out which areas are doing this program? Well, they're they're spread around the country, and they're areas that have big spans between the highest and the lowest rents. Okay, um, and they're picked by HUD. They're available. You can search for small area fair market rent. Okay. Uh, the Center for Policy and Budget Priorities um, has a report on this, and it names all of the the 24 areas. But every other area can adopt them voluntarily, and some have. Um, you know, uh, for example, we've been following in Milwaukee. There's a voucher mobility program that the Fair Housing Center there and some philanthropies and research firms are collaborating to help voucher holders move out of high poverty areas. So they provide them extra counseling, extra support looking for units, um, extra financial assistance for higher security deposits and moving expenses. And they've gotten the Milwaukee Housing Authority to adopt the small area rent standard in a couple of zip codes. So that's helpful, but um, they don't have it metropolitan area wide. So the suburban county outside of Milwaukee, which is where more of the high opportunity neighborhoods are, don't have the higher rent standards. So that's an example of um, a place that a local group could organize to help get this policy change so that there's more mobility um, opportunities. And as another example, in Dallas, they do have this requirement to use the small area rent standards. And we've talked to several landlords in the Dallas area who prefer to rent to voucher holders. So just to counter the myth that voucher holders are bad tenants, these landlords prefer voucher tenants as their tenants because they're more stable, they move less often, they take better care of their property. Um, and there's some firms in the doubt, we came across one firm, a sort of mission-driven for-profit firm, that because it can charge the market rents of the higher cost areas of the Dallas region, They've bought single family homes in high opportunity areas with the express purpose of renting them to Section 8 tenants, to families so their, their kids can go to better schools. And it's been a great program. Um, you know, they have a lot of tenants in the 
sort of suburbs outside of Dallas. Now, there's also one of these communities that has voted to ban Section 8 tenants from their community. So there's always work to be done in that community. The landlords who like their Section 8 tenants and the residents who don't believe in this exclusionary tactic could organize to counter it. Um, right now, it's held up in court, so they can't actually evict the Section 8 tenants. But yeah. So okay. opportunities and challenges all along the way. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, I mean, you mentioned this new uh, new uh, protected class that I had never heard before, uh, source of income discrimination, which is essentially what these, these you know, the people with the not my backyard people want the Section 8 people out. That's what they're that's what they're espousing is a, just another form of discrimination, which you have seen all throughout the first book, The Color of Law. And, and here's a perfect example of how it's continuing uh, to manifest itself now through source of income uh, discrimination. So, you know, the best Section 8 offices that I have worked with when I, or in my properties uh, were the ones that, that really were, they, they were landlord friendly and they were tenant tenant friendly. They really ran it right down the middle. They, I mean, you, you have some Section 8 offices that, that are horrible. And then you have others that are just you. You don't mind working with Section Eight because you know you're going to have a fair shake in that particular office. So um, let's say and we're going to touch upon the, the Just Cause book here that we want to make one of these types of changes to the Section Eight law. What do we do at the local level at that local office? Because I know those people. I know the the director. She's awesome. What do I, how do I uh, bring it to her attention? Well, it starts by, I think, organizing the community. So getting people who are concerned with these issues, both residents, landlords, you know, uh, a spectrum, a broad spectrum of the sort of stakeholders in that community. Mm -hmm. um, could call a meeting with the, the housing authority officials and call their attention to the problems, the issues with the program and what, what the limitations are. You know, there are some we give in just action. Also, we mentioned some administrative changes that housing authorities make to the Section 8 program that make it a lot easier for landlords to engage with the program. So, you know, I think housing authorities want their Section 8 program to be successful. And uh, it's up to sort of community groups, organized residents, landlords to help them push them forward and and making changes to make it more uh, successful and effective. OK, so but what pushback will I get? I mean, that let's say I speak to that, that the person in charge of the Section 8 office. Where do they have to make the modifications? Do they have to get approval above their head to do these things? Or is it strictly a decision of the local office? Well, it depends on what we're talking about. So the source of income discrimination law, that's something that would be passed by the local um, elected body, city, city council, board of supervisors, the state legislature. So that's a, that's a um, law that's passed. Now, the more administrative changes to the Section 8 program, like changing the rent standards or changing the inspection um, process or the, you know, how how landlords sign their papers, you know, the, the ways to make the program easier to use for landlords and tenants alike, that involves going to the housing authority. And they, you know, housing authorities are under-resourced. They have, you know, four times as many people who want Section 8 and are eligible than they can yeah. provide. So they're stretched thin. So the pushback yeah. I can imagine you getting is we don't have the funds for this. We don't have the time to figure it out. But again, I think it, you know, they want to, to provide a good program. These are, you know, they're public servants in, in this job because they want to help tenants um, find safe, affordable housing. So if we could help them um, and show them examples, like we give in just action of communities that have done this, like it's not impossible. It's not so cost prohib prohibitive and so administratively difficult that they can't do it. I think they need some um, probably help in seeing that and, and some pressure from the community to know that they're that the community is paying attention and that we understand what, what's happening with Section 8 and what kind of impact it can have if it's um, effectively run. Okay. 
All right. Now, let me get into another topic and, and tell me if any of your your, uh, your you know items on your blueprint here uh, include zoning. Is zoning still an issue? I mean, zoning that that Buchanan case I mentioned, you know, then it went on to to um, Atlanta, you know, R1 zoning for white families, R2 zoning, R1 zoning for black families. It, it was ridiculous. Is zoning today still an issue as far as uh, de jure segregation goes? Definitely. Uh, you say single family only zoning kind of took the place of race-based zoning when that okay. was outlawed. Um, so communities that say you can only build single family homes on large lots, which is 75% of the residentially zoned land across the country is zoned only for single family homes. Yeah. Wait, give me that number again. 75% of residentially zoned land throughout the country. And in many communities, it's way higher than that. Some 100%, some it's 99%, 95%. You know, a lot of uh, these exclusive suburbs that were built for whites only are now, you know, primarily white, partly because they only allow large single family homes on large lots, which limits the housing supply and ensures that those homes stay expensive. Yeah. So for all the reasons, you know, that my dad talked about that African-Americans are less likely to have intergenerational wealth to afford larger homes in exclusive communities by only through zoning, only allowing those homes to be built in those communities. You know, it effectively prices out African-Americans and and others who didn't have the benefit of these uh, buying into these communities when they were affordable. So rezoning or upzoning, different ways of calling, um, outlawing single family zoning only. So some states have done that. California, Oregon has for, for cities of certain sizes. Washington's considering it. Vermont is considering it. Maine has passed a rezoning, upzoning law. And some cities have, Minneapolis, um, Arlington, Virginia. So they've made it so you can't have only single family, you know, there are single family only zones have been up zoned to now allow, it depends on the place, but duplexes, triplexes, maybe some cottage apartments or yeah. small multifamily. And that allows a more diverse uh, set of housing types in a community, which would um, presumably have a wider range of affordability. Now, we don't really know what will happen because all of these rezoning laws are fairly new, but what we argue is it's a first step to create more um, affordable housing opportunities in these communities. And then the next step in to ensure that this upzoning is a tool of desegregation is to have race-specific um, preferences or subsidies to ensure that African-Americans have the opportunity to get into those homes. Mm. You know, I'm I'm dealing with that here in my hometown of Nashua, New Hampshire. I've been looking at uh, buying a particular lot and we can't get what we want. And, you know, because of this zoning and, you know, the two guys at the zoning office are kind of giving me the wink, wink, nod, nod that, well, if you just wait a, a year, we're rezoning the whole city so that we can fit more people in. And, you know, so we're seeing that happen in our town. Um, another thing is that with the workforce housing, uh, I mean, do you talk about that at all? That's one of the biggest, you know, brouhaha's now. And and another thing that I'm doing, I'm actually, I own a, a part owner of three hotels now that we are converting to apartments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is one of the biggest problems is that people cannot find the housing, the affordable housing. You know, you can sit here and I can tell you that we have a million apartment units about to come online in the next 12 months, equal to what we did back in 1973, the more more starts than, than ever before. But the problem is those, when they come online, they're not affordable housing. Those are class A properties. They're, I mean, we're not solving this affordable housing issue with all these apartments that are coming online. We've got to do something at the, at the uh, lower level for these people. And uh, you know, Nashua has changed the density. If you make some of the units affordable, uh, you know, workforce housing, you can add more units to the mix. But do you talk at all about workforce housing in your book? Yes, we do. Uh, okay. the, first of all, I want to say that workforce housing is a misnomer. 
uh, the you know, we have a as we talked about a few minutes ago, we have subsidies for the lowest income families with Section Eight. There are market rate units available. There's this whole missing middle, which you're terming workforce housing, of people who own, earn too much to qualify for Section Eight and too little to earn um, to pay market rates. But the implication of that term is that people in Section Eight aren't in the workforce. Of course, they are. Yeah, people who are who are uh, working at McDonald's or at the uh, um, other low paid service, and they're in the workforce. So the notion that the only people in the workforce are people who earn too much to uh, earn Section Eight to to be qualified for Section Eight is is wrong. Most African Americans uh, are above the qualification for Section Eight, and yet they can't afford housing because they don't have uh, the inherited wealth that white families have. But the housing crisis today is so severe that even white middle-class families, working-class families can't afford housing. So simply upzoning, as Leah said, is only a first step. It's only a first step. And if you simply upzone and permit duplexes and triplexes and so forth, um, African-Americans will be outbid by whites even for those, because we have such an enormous housing shortage. So one of the themes in our book is that uh, we need racially explicit preferences to remedy the unconstitutional policies of the past in order to ensure that with policies like upzoning, you can um, increase the housing opportunities for Black families who have been excluded by racially explicit public policy. Okay, so... uh I love that, you know, you're absolutely right, but it's, it's just goes to a, all workforce housing is, is really a marketing term. I mean, it's essentially another form of, of rental assist, but if you called it Section 8, white families would be insulted by it. And so we don't want to insult that, that group of people. So now we call it workforce housing. But you're saying, well, we need a racially explicit policies to remedy the racially explicit discrimination that's gone on in the past. So what are some of the racially explicit policies that that you recommend? Well, um, uh, developers can give preferences to African-Americans for the additional uh, units that are developed with this kind of upzoning. This would be uh, justifiable. Of course, it would be challenged. Uh, there are uh, there is one uh, law that uh, per permits it, but it's never been tested. It's called um, the Special Purpose Credit Program, which uh, permits uh, racially explicit preferences for uh, people who've been discriminated against in the past. But developers need the courage to tackle this issue if we're serious about uh, addressing racial segregation. Now, is there any you know, like quid pro quo with the with the government on those types of programs? Because usually developers aren't going to rush out and do this unless they're getting a little something in return. I mean, do they get, have to wait for tax credits to become available, or uh, you know, they get any form of accelerated depreciation, or what? What would they? What would you have to give the developers to make them do this? Because that's really what it comes down to. You're, you're muted, Leah. Sorry. A locality could require developers to give preferences. So there's places that have inclusionary zoning policies where when you sort of like what you mentioned, you get a density bonus for building some affordable right. units. Some have a zoning requirement where if you build market rate units, you have to set aside a certain percentage as affordable. And then it could also require that those units have a preference for who, who gets in them. It could be race-based. Some um, and we argue it should be a race specific preference and some localities, you know, worried about the legal challenges to that, find other workarounds and they, um, they have, you know, preferences for, for people who've been displaced from the area, maybe because, you know, prices have gone up and the area has gentrified. Um, there's also, uh, you know, banks, the special purpose credit program is a program that banks can adopt to give favorable mortgages to African-Americans. We also discuss private 
you know, citizens and companies who've started down payment assistance grant programs where they raise money um, and provide grants to African-American homeowners to help them with down payment assistance, uh, to help them pay for the down payment on a home. So those are some okay. examples. Those are great answers. That's I can actually see that happening here in my town because I, they've already done things like that. And, you know, whenever, uh, you know, they we're thinking about building, we always have to check to see what is it the city is going to require of us in order to get this thing done. And that, that type of thing could happen all the time. And even that special credit program uh, among the, uh, among, you know, you talk about these, these big banks trying to do something special. Here's a perfect example of how to do it. That's, that's very, that very good stuff. Very good. And, all right. Now, Leah, tell me something I don't know, okay? Give me some more of your action plans in the blueprint that I haven't even touched upon yet. Okay, here's one that many people don't think about. So credit scores, right? Credit scores, we think of them as an objective rating of our financial health, our our financial, you know, our likelihood we'll repay a future debt. What we've done in the past, our history. Right. So it's objective. It's just based on your financial history. If you've defaulted on a loan before, you're less likely to get a good loan in the future. If you've always paid back your loans, you're more likely to get a mortgage with a good rate. That makes some sense. But the way the credit scoring system works is it only factors in a certain kind of financial history. So it's the kind of financial history that whites are more likely to have than African-Americans. So if you've had a mortgage in the past and you've paid it faithfully, you have a good credit score. But if you've never had a mortgage because you've been locked out of home buying for generations and you don't have intergenerational wealth to pay a down payment and you live in a community that doesn't have bank branches, you know, for all of these reasons, you've been a renter for your whole life, which African-Americans are more likely to have been renters when applying for a mortgage than whites. That rental payment history, even if you've never missed a rent payment in your entire life or never been late on a utility bill payment, it doesn't factor into your credit score. So you don't get credit in your credit score for being a good, faithful renter. Um, So African-Americans are less likely to have credit scores than whites. And when they do, they're often lower. Their average scores are lower than whites. And that's purely because of the financial history that they're more likely to have is not reflected in a credit score. Okay, let me tell you why that is easier to solve today than ever before. Because, you know, when I, one of my students buys an apartment building, an apartment complex, you know, I, I help them understand the property management side and how to get themselves set up. Today, the software that the computer, the online programs that you, so many of them you can buy into to manage your property and do the property accounting and make it so easy for your tenants to pay their rent electronically. You know, nobody collects rent anymore. It comes in, everything's done electronically. And these systems, you know, the the Yardy, the rentmanager.com, all these systems that everybody uses should be able to report the online payments the same way your mortgage company does, the exact same way. It would not be a big stretch for this to happen. You know, the, the even the mom and pop shops, the little 10 unit properties, you could just as easily get them on electronic payments and all of that gets reported. Uh, you know, that is, it's it, it would make everyone's life so much easier and it would be, enable those people that that could never, the, I mean, my mortgage gets reported on the on the minute. Mm-hmm. You know, my my tenancy does not. So it's um yeah, that's a great, that's an easy fix. Exactly. So but, to fix it, it involves talking to the local banks and credit unions who offer mortgages and and pressure them to take into account this rental payment history. You could provide yeah. it to them for your tenants. Yeah. There's also some companies that are popping up to sort of serve as a middleman between property managers and banks. So compiling all the rent payment da- data, providing it to banks and it, um, the sort of anecdotal uh, stories I've heard about this are that it just shoots up people's credit scores by wow. a lot just by taking this into account. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, I mean, if we can do it for your car payments, if we can do it for Macy's, you know, your Macy's card, it can easily do it for your, for your rent as well. And I bet you what's going to happen is th- that those types of companies that you just mentioned, uh, those third parties, they're going to get purchased by the big guys, the yardies and the, and the on sites and the one sites. And all of a sudden, every, as soon as one Lego breaks, everybody is going to have it because they, they have to keep up with the, with the uh, Joneses and everyone's system is going to be able to report that. And that's going to be, that's going to be an easy fix and a huge one. I can see that. That's, that's very, very cool. Very cool. So, yeah. So it really starts with the tenants, you know, pressing the landlords say, Hey, you got to report my, my good payment history. And uh, yeah, cause there's, listen, there's, yeah, you're going to get your bad eggs. You always do. But there are some people that pay their rent on time every single month and you never get credit for it. You never hear a, a peep out of it. And then you can you can even take some of the Section 8 payments that come in on time and use that to the to the tenant's benefit. Well, funny you should mention it. <laughs> the Section 8 program <laughs> allows tenants to use their Section 8 towards home ownership. So okay. that's another way that a local public housing authority, it's up to the public housing authority to adopt that aspect of the program. But those tenants could use their voucher towards a, mor- a mortgage payment, just like they could towards a rental payment. Okay. And that goes a long way in helping those families gain stability and earn equity and, you know, come out of poverty um, doing that. And that takes the housing authority to kind of stretch beyond what they're used to doing learn about the home ownership market, find lenders who are willing to provide mortgages to their tenants. Um, but it, they tend to be way, you know, very stable mortgage payment, mortgagees, because they, they're part of their mortgage payment is covered by the voucher program. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that I learned when you were on my call, um, which just blew me away, is how sec, and this is now since change, you can, you can correct me, uh, but how people on Section 8 can't have savings accounts. They can't have savings. Mm. And that was a, w- one of the requirements. And then, of course, you're never going to get out of your situation if you can't even put some dollars away. That's- let, me, let me add one thing to what Leah just said, uh, or maybe two things. <laughs> <laughs> one is that um, the, uh, the excuse for not including rental payments in credit scoring is that it's too hard to, to get the information. That is, uh, mortgage is easy, mortgage payments are easy to get because uh, big banks issue mortgages. But Section 8, public housing authorities have the information about whether Section 8 voucher holders uh, have been paying their rent on time. And it was just as easy to get this information from Section 8 from, from public housing authorities as it is to get mortgage payments from banks. So this excuse, at least for Section 8 tenants, doesn't apply. Oh, let me let me add to this. Before you go on, let me just add to that. I pay for a service, CoStar.com. They're the biggest aggregator of data among the housing world. I, I buy their data. And they can, because they're, they also have apartments.com and because they have, all, you know, other, uh, even Yardi has their own reporting. I can tell you what the... Uh, what the average late payment is, how many days it is late in a, in Milwaukee uh, last month. I, I can tell you by the 10th of the month how many people have paid their, their rents, the average uh, that people have paid their rents in one particular city in, 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 uh, in the country. Because this data is all at everyone's fingertips now. Even I mean, we just aggregate this data because everyone in the real estate business our data is up to the day. That's how fast it it, we, it flies to us. So to say that we don't have it or we can't report it, that's baloney. It's there. We have the, the ability. And all it takes is someone in Washington to say, you now have to start reporting this. And they'll fix it. They'll easily fix it. The data is there. You yeah. Know, and while we wait for Washington to do that, we can work with the local banks in our own communities to start yeah. using that data. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, Richard, uh, Leah and I would like to hear your second point. (laughs) Well, I'm just going back to the point you made earlier about um, what you called workforce housing, and what we call missing middle housing. Missing middle. And you asked about um, uh, if there are federal tax credits 
And we, in just action, we do actually write about one. It's called the new market, um, uh, what's it called, the new market tax, tax credit. New ma market tax credits, yes. And it's a, a federal program that's available to developers uh, like you. Uh, its only requirement is that 20% of the revenue in the uh, uh, project has to come from commercial sources. So, for example, if you have a development with retail stores on the ground uh, on the ground floor and uh, apartments above it, you can get the, the new market tax credits. It's like the Section 8 program to finance this uh, missing middle housing. Uh, so that's the other point I wanted to make. Okay, very neat. And we talk about this in Just Action as well. All right, guys, we are running up against it. I tell you, this has been so much fun. Love seeing the Rothsteins. I love it when the Rothsteins are on my show. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to get out there and see your dad when he comes to Cambridge. Leah, are you going to be with him? I will. Oh, you will. And then you have to, and then he hightails it to the Cape, la di da, and he puts you to work out in Boulder, Colorado working. the next That's day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What's the matter? He didn't invite you for vacation this year? God. Yeah, but I'll be Come busy. on, Dad. <laughs> I'll make it there eventually. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody. The name of the book, the two books are, and I'll hold up my version, The Color of Law. I love this book. Um, it, And I don't even want to tell you, Dad, the two books have had such amazing, and then the next one is, is Just Action, How to Challenge Segregation Enacted Under the Color of Law. Um, and just so everybody, you know, The Color of Law, it's de jure segregation. It's Folks, it's a great read, and I cannot wait to read uh, Just Cause. I'll have it. I'll have it done because I just bought my ticket to Cambridge, and I bought it with the sending me the book too. So, um, so I will, uh, Richard. I'll, I'll get down there. Hella high water. I'll get down there to Cambridge and uh, and uh, try to try to come out and independent. And uh, we'll be <laughs> we'll be all over the country the beginning of June, yeah. and there's yes. information on our website about where we'll be. So go to justactionthebook.org. Uh, justactionbook.org. Justactionbook.org. And uh, click at the top under appearances. There are still many dates coming up. Uh, you can check it out. Um, and Rich, this is a, you're speaking at this. You're at the, the Brattle Theater, I think. And so this is a, I'm going to sit down. It's going to be like a Professor Rothstein. I know, I know he hates it when I say that, but that's that's what it's going to feel like. Uh, I will look forward to it. It'll be a blast. Thank you so much, guys, for being on my show. It's so good to see you. I'm so psyched about the new book. I cannot wait to read it. It's always eye-opening. Uh, folks, if you're looking for a book that's going to change your life, I highly recommend whatever these folks write. So uh, check it out, and uh, I will see you uh, this summer. Great to see you guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care. Bye, Richard. <laughs>